I've heard him talk about it twice now on two different podcasts. I don't need to hear it again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> User error 66. I'm Joe. I'm Alan. And I'm Dan. And we're back. And let's get straight on with it. Let's talk about free desktop standards. Not something I know much about, but I know, Dan, it's something you care quite a lot about. Yeah, I think that um, something that we've been thinking a lot about recently at elementary is kind of where free desktop stands today and what it has historically been and where we can go with it in the future. And um, it seems like that maybe because I wasn't there, I'm idealizing it, but it seems like there was a point in time where free desktop was really active and there was a lot of stuff coming out. And we have stuff like the icon theme spec and the dot desktop spec and uh, things that are implemented across all of our free desktops. And now that we have some new desktops that have come onto the scene, like Pantheon and Mate, um, it seems like we need to be more active and kind of get back into free desktop again. And with next generation technologies like Flatpak coming out um, and portals and all these kinds of concerns about application development, and new features that developers want and how platforms are built in kind of a future sandbox world that um, there hasn't been as much activity in what you would consider the free desktop space as we need. And from kind of looking out on what people perceive of the free desktop, it kind of seems like the broader community isn't really happy with what free desktop has been not doing. Isn't this a byproduct of just fewer people working on free software desktops? So like I, I I appreciate you said you mentioned a couple of new desktops, relatively speaking, new, like Mate and Pantheon. But I mean, they've been around a while, years, and it feels like the free software desktop is trailing off in terms of contributors. There are silos like the KDE developers and the GNOME developers and you guys who are working actively on their areas but it feels like there was a heyday some years ago which uh, has now passed and the free desktop has got to the point of being a minimum viable product and we've got a lot of desktop environments that work okay you know for us um, and that's good enough and a lot of people moved on to either the mac or just other things entirely and so what you really need is more people, more contributors, more interested people at the early on, like students, for example. Would that help? I'm not sure because I don't. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I don't know what's happened or or why that it seems like there's this gap here. But I, I'm glad that you are also perceiving it as as if there was this heyday, right? Right. Because it it seems like. We have so much activity right now about applications and everybody's building app stores and everybody's building platforms and everybody's talking about APIs and, and we're kind of getting into this like, hey, we really need to care about applications to make um, Linux-based operating systems relevant whether we're talking about um, enterprise applications or consumer applications or embedded applications, like applications are important. Um, but it kind of seems like no one's talking about cool, like let's have free desktop meetings or conferences or like what what is it? Is it because we don't care about mailing lists anymore? Like why isn't there a bigger push for everyone to get together like it seemed like we used to have? Well, isn't that what the Libre Application Summit was about? Now it's been renamed as the Linux Application Summit. That was kind of my impression going into it is I thought it was a conference for uh, desktop developers to get together and kind of revisit like how how what parts can we collaborate on to build more of a cohesive platform. But um, Alan, is that kind of where it's going? Because I know you're more involved with some of the planning of it. Yeah, I missed today's planning meeting because uh, I was busy. But uh, as I understand, I mean, I've never seen it as that. But then I didn't go to the previous um, events. I always got the impression that it was aimed at pulling developers in, new developers in, 
to bring their apps to the desktop. I think there was, I think there's a disconnect there. There's some people in the organization of the group who believe that our desktop is in a good state. What we need now is more apps. Whereas others like yourself believe that the desktop is not in a good state and we need more standards and we need people to work on these fundamental infrastructural components where back in the day you had people who were working on the periphery of some of these projects who had the time to navel gaze and pontificate and create standards and discuss things at length at you know either on mailing lists or in person at events like Guarec and and other events and i think those people just aren't there anymore and there and there are everyone seems to have found their role like whether it's working on the sound system or the print system or um, desktop packaging or whatever it might be, people have very specific roles now. And there aren't those people in the community who have the big picture, um, like the greybeards who can help cross desktop, cross company, cross organization, cross project, build the consensus around these things. And I don't think the Linux Application Summit would ever have been that. I think that was, I, I don't think it aimed that high. Is that something you're considering with the Snap development? Um, because I know that that's aimed to be cross-platform, um, completely cross-platform across server and IoT, as well as a desktop. Um, I know you've had problems with theming, and that's something that people complain about because of the sandboxing, the confinement. But do you care about like the free desktop standards or or what? Well, we care in the if they exist and they make sense and they fit with our design then sure then it's a good thing for us to implement those things but if they don't and they hinder us or slow us down then it maybe doesn't make sense and i think that's the case with any of these these standards you can't just robotically religiously implement the standard and say well this standard that was developed you know how many years ago is now fixed in stone and that is the standard and everyone must use it. Like take, for example, categories of applications. If you look through any app store on Linux, you'll you'll see the categories of applications and some of them are just so obtuse and old and crusty and it, it makes you realize that those categories were invented, you know, in a different time when different types of applications were popular. Whereas now people have video editors and they have social media applications and other things that don't really fit in those boxes. And that's just one small example where the standardization is great, but sometimes you need to go outside that box. Um, and to your first point, snaps were, were originally intended to be for IoT. They weren't originally intended to be for the desktop. They are intended for IoT server but it turns out people wanted a way of getting up-to-date applications on their desktop. And um, I don't know if you've seen a relatively recent interview that um, Swapnil did with Mark Shuttleworth. You can find it on YouTube, where he talks about his surprise at how popular uh, the Linux desktop still is. And so as a result of that, there are very popular snapped applications in in the store. And yeah, we still have problems. There are still bugs related to theming, related to startup speed, relating relating to application size. All software has bugs. We have some. We have our fair share. And sure, we need to fix them. What about notifications, though? Dan, that's something you've complained about before, that a lot of applications kind of don't respect the standards there. Yeah, and that's something that um, when we looked into how do we resolve this situation, um, we kind of discovered that at one time there was a proposed free desktop specification that uh, was followed by like one or two maybe implementations, um, but then it never really got adopted. So everybody kind of started doing their own thing and we've kind of come around to a point where, okay, if we expect – um, applications like Steam or like Electron applications or these big uh, third-party applications from major ISVs to work in as best way as possible because they don't want to target a single desktop environment. They want to hit like whatever Linux is as a platform. Um, we need to have a minimum viable specification that works for everyone and we can 
differ in our implementations a little bit, but the the kind of situation that we have right now is that there's essential features like that where users don't really have any control over notifications because there is no real standard. And so how are you going to make that happen then? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. That's the hard part is, is we can only talk to people and, and you know submit patches here and there and send out emails and say, hey, this is important to us and we would like to improve this situation. But if if people from other desktops don't also care about that thing, I have no idea where we go. How do we find the people that care and that say, hey, yes, this is important for us all to find a common ground? I wonder if some people are just worn out by it. Like they've had these conversations and it's some of the same people across these different projects um, that have had these conversations over the years. It's not burnout. They're just worn down by having these conversations and nothing moving forward, which is another reason why I think you need some fresh blood to to fill the pipe with new ideas and fresh people who are interested in contributing. Like I never see when uh, Google Summer of Code happens or Google coding. I never see people talking about free desktop specs or I never see people saying, you know, let's contribute to the free desktop. It's always one specific project, whether that's an application or a desktop environment or an, an OS. It's it's never let's contribute to the standards. And I appreciate that's difficult for a student to do over a summer, but there's certainly some parts that could be picked off. Maybe Maybe that is something that could be done over one of these summer projects like Google Summer of Code. Yeah, possibly. Um, it's difficult because I think for some of the things, um, it's not just work that needs to get done, right? It's people that need to agree. Yeah, it's consensus. Right. And, and so saying, hey, um, you know, even if we have people who are interested in implementation, it's um, getting people to care or agree that this is a, an important or needed thing. Like, for example, something that we proposed quite a while ago and sent emails off and made a blog post about and drew up a spec for was um, having settings URLs because we noticed that applications wanted to include links to system settings when they need to set up hardware or ensure that network connectivity is there or things like that. And it seemed like it kind of never really took off anywhere because uh, other desktop developers said, ah, I don't think that's a thing that application developers need. And so that's something that, as far as I know, only we've implemented, but other desktops have kind of said, ah, nah, that's not important. Mm. Hashtag ask error. If you witness a petty crime, should you intervene? Well, obviously, no, because uh, that's dangerous. So uh, does anyone disagree with me on that? Uh, yeah, I do. I think it's your moral duty as a citizen to help weed out the scallywags in your local community. And uh, if you witness someone doing something and it's uh, objectionable uh, and, you know, morally repugnant, then, yeah, do something about it. Because if you don't, the world's just going to go down and down and down because nobody's contributing. So yeah, you need to contribute in a positive way. I kind of feel like there's a question here of like, is the law just? And that's kind of where my deciding factor is, right? Like if you, if you see somebody doing something that's like, well, that's technically against the rules, but it doesn't really hurt anybody, then I'm kind of more inclined to turn a blind eye. But if it's something like, um, you know, if you see um, a child who has, you know, put something in their pocket at a store and letting their parent know or something, hey, you know. That was exactly the kind of scenario I was thinking. And that's what, what triggered this question. I was in a, a local store and a young scallywag or a bunch of young scallywags uh, were stuffing produce in their pockets and I happened to be standing in the line waiting for the till and I was just staring straight at them as they were doing it. And they uh, saw me doing it and were staring back and they they knew that I'd seen what they'd done. And I just said, are you going to put that back? And they started swearing at me and calling me really foul names in the shop. But they then put it back and then walked out the store. And so I prevented some level of loss in that store. Now, does it affect me? I don't know. Like, it's possible that that store, if it had too much loss, 
that it might not be financially viable to run that store anymore or the protection that they would have to put in place for their produce would make it no longer financially viable to have a a shop at that location and that would inconvenience me because that shop I use, right? Or maybe a member of staff would be adversely affected because they'd lose their job or I don't know, there's, there's a million different reasons why that kind of activity this objectionable activity by those people thieving you could argue and i don't know how you would argue that it's it's okay because it's some faceless corporation but someone is going to get adversely affected somewhere down the line even if it's a gigantic billion dollar company the woman behind the counter needs a job and she needs to get paid and if the shop closes she won't yeah but i just don't fancy getting stabbed so you know right well you live in a, a a horrible part of the world and you're unfortunate it's unfortunate for you that it's all kebab shops and knives whereas around my way it's all donkey sanctuaries and and corner shops and trees so as I, I i'm pretty sure i'm less likely to get stabbed where i am um so i have less of a problem with that and obviously i'm not in america so i'm not going to get shot <laughs> Yeah, I guess it depends on a lot of factors, right? Personal risk is, of course, a factor. Uh, the severity of the the crime is a factor. But I don't know. I guess I guess in general, I agree with the idea of kind of as a society, we should help enforce like a society that is um, morally. Um, it, it, kind of that idea of if if you were in that position, would you want that thing to happen to you, or would you want somebody to stand up for you or help you out? If you're if you're a shop owner and and somebody could have stopped you from losing product, you know, wouldn't you want somebody to have helped you out in that situation? Right, it's do unto others, basically. Right. I I remember being in um in Liverpool at uh, Og Camp a year or so ago and uh first thing in the morning we we're walking towards the venue a few of us and uh this guy walked into a bakery and grabbed a sandwich and just shoved it down his trousers and walked out and i witnessed that and the woman behind the counter obviously recognized him because this happens a lot and she came running out and she was looking left and right to see where he was and i just pointed at him and said it's in his trousers and he was like he looked at me as if to say dude like don't give me up that easily and i was like well you know i would like that shop not to shut i would like that business to continue running and you're not helping so and i just walked away but yeah, personal risk. If, if if the guy was bigger than me and looked like he would take me on, then yeah, I might not. But I'd try. Okay, I think it's time for us to uh, be old men yelling at clouds. Let's talk about the old web versus the new web. And I don't know, there, there are various points that you could argue when it changed. You could maybe say that when Facebook became massive, that was it. But I think if you want to go for a technical definition, maybe when JavaScript ran amok and uh, we just ended up with these ridiculously heavy websites, is it just nostalgia or was it better back then? Have you seen uh, This Is A Fucking Website? I don't think so. Or, no, it's called Motherfucking Website. Motherfuckingwebsite.com. I will have a look now. Yeah. And I think this is kind of the epitome of probably your stance. Oh, except they didn't specify a background color, so fuck him. <laughs> but the kind of the point of this is a motherfucking website is to show that without any kind of styling, that you can build a website that's very fast, that works on every screen in every browser, that is very accessible. So I think you do have a point that without all of the fancy frameworks and everything that you can build a completely functional website. However, I think that the big problem that we have is that users no longer expect websites, they expect web applications. And when they visit your company here's website, that they want to interact with it in some way. They don't just want to consume data, they want to run a search or they want to, you know, get feedback in some way or submit feedback in some way. They want to interact with it. And that's where it starts becoming an issue is that they want to submit some kind of input and have you give them some kind of variable output. 
I love the uh, website you've you've suggested we look at, and if you view the source code, it is indeed like mostly basic HTML that I would have written in about 1999. But it also has Google Analytics at the bottom, <laughs> and inside the comment it says, "Yes, I know. Want to fight about it?" <laughs> so yeah, it's very cute. I mean, yeah, I I used to have a website which looked very much like this, and I added a, um, I think I I was on a web ring or something. So oh god, uh, and in fact, it's still on archive.org. If you go back and look at popey.com from 1998 or thereabouts, you'll see how awful my website was. Um, and I, I tried to add stuff like guest books and, you know, all that kind of interactivity that was web 0.5. Um, and it was, it was hard. Whereas now it's, it's super easy. But the flip side is every website is so heavy and slow. As Joe says, it's just, you need to have a decently specced computer just to visit a few web pages. It's, it's quite ludicrous. Um, the amount of power you need to visit these websites, which yes, okay, they are applications but they shouldn't have to be for a lot of them then they're, they're not you look at something like um like lobsters or hacker news or something like that which is an aggregated list of news articles it's pretty simple pretty straightforward code it doesn't need to be super complicated but then people users have all kinds of different devices and so it has to reflow and you know it has to gradually load because some people have slow connections and you know it has to be accessible and so you add on all these extra things and makes it super bloaty and also blame designers damn it those damn designers because when you're advertising any product now it has to be animated and things have to slide in and it has to be like a video or as you're scrolling the thing changes and you know animations and whiz bang and and as every designer tries to one up the last designer to make something more attractive to the people that they're trying to market to it just gets more intense just to show a product photo and really that's what it is it's a product photo right but now it's like 30 layers of javascript and css and embedded videos and and i don't i don't know if we can go back i don't know if we can go back because that's what users expect now when they go to your website if you just have a plain old boring photo they're like well obviously this product is not as professional as this other product that has this fancy whizbang presentation i'm going to try and apply some knowledge from a previous episode here right so supposing you have a fairly shit connection and you go to one of these fancy websites, then in them trying to make the UI better, they've made the UX much worse. Yes, and that is indeed a thing. Yes, um, right? So that might be something that people are saying, well, um, you know, we have to look at our demographics and the people that are purchasing our kind of products are, you know, 80% of them are using this web browser on this connection in this country. And right. So there's, there's all sort of data that backs up that, ah, you know, this is actually better in general for the people that we care about and that we're not trying to market to absolutely everyone. But what about the cultural shift as well, rather than just the technical one? Because that's kind of what I'd picture talking about rather than the technical stuff here, is that was it better before all the normal people came mm -hmm. onto <laughs> the, the internet and the web? You know, back when things were more anonymous and stuff, before Facebook, basically. Well, I yeah, I, I don't like that Facebook has become some people's internet. I don't like that for many people, going online means opening Facebook and scrolling up and down a lot and then maybe playing a game and they don't actually go outside those boundaries unless they click a news article, which may be, um, you know, hosted inside Facebook. You know, the article may be actually inside Facebook. And so they don't actually even leave the website. I don't, I don't like that walled garden. It feels very much like the old AOL and CompuServe of days of yore. And I, I, I don't like that because that gives a very myopic view of the world and keeps people focused on that very addictive user interface. I've been, without wishing to be that guy who says, oh, I don't use Facebook or, you know, I deleted my account or anything. I've just found myself not opening that tab uh, anymore. I almost never open it because I find it horrible uh, uh, that I'm being sucked into that crap. Yeah, and it's a it's a major it's a major problem, right? That we have these kind of filter bubbles like 
uh, Facebook or even, you know, your, your Twitter feed or your Instagram feed or the subreddits that you subscribe to or whatever it is, whatever your personal type of internet portal that you use. I mean, the web is so big that that is, that is how we consume the web, right? Is we go to some kind of portal and then we scroll through it until we find a link to someplace on the web. And it's, it's scary because it does limit the kinds of things that you are exposed to. And it fosters an attitude of outrage, I think, like really easily outraged people who aren't really exposed to, I don't know, the harsher side of things. And then the second someone says one word wrong, everyone just jumps on them and it just gets really outraged about it. And then about, I don't know, three or four hours later, just moves on to the next thing. So what you need to do as a developer, is add a gigantic JavaScript application to your website that includes a fact checker for all these posts. Yeah. I don't know. I think I think the immediacy is part of the problem. The fact that you can get access to this information and bang out a reply within seconds of seeing the initial um the initial information or news or whatever it is. Like I remember the days when friends of mine didn't have internet and or didn't have internet at work. And so they would only see stuff in the evening. And so they're having to catch up on lengthy email threads or conversations in the evening. Whereas now I see someone complain on what's in a WhatsApp group because they made, they made a statement about, you know, some family problem. Their son had stepped on a nail and uh, he was unwell. And then a few hours later complains that nobody has replied and wished him well. And like, you're all horrible bastards because <laughs> my son stepped on a nail and I announced it in here and none of you have said, oh, how is he? And I hope he's all right. You're all horrible people. And I know you've all seen it. And it's like, well, geez. Like, I mean, obviously there's specific issues there, but this immediacy of like ex the expectation that if I put something out there, you will see it straight away and you'll be able to respond to it right away. Whereas people used to do other shit, like go outside or do their job. And the social stuff was something you do in the evening, like outside of work. There was no expectation back then that people would have instant access to your your brain straight away. It's a very weird change that's happened in the last like 10 or 15 years. So what do we do? Do we, is there some kind of new wave of ultra minimalist design that will come through and say no to all these things and we need to go back to the roots or, um, you know, how, what, how do we move on from here? Because we've got to this point where this is kind of the expectation. And as someone who, has a website um what what do you recommend what what do you want me to do with this website <laughs> add an artificial delay if you can tell that someone is typing really fast and started typing immediately after somebody else then probably nothing good is happening and you should slow <laughs> them down and let them post their reply but don't let anyone else see it until a few minutes later and then if they're still replying really fast, delay it further and delay it further and further. Like rate limit people's access to the internet. Slow everyone down a little bit. Let everyone just think about what they're typing a little bit more. Loading screens for everyone. <laughs> yes, I approve. Hashtag ask error. What are your pet hates? Well, apart from the words pet hates and pet peeves, uh, Let's put those aside. Um, Popey, what are your pet hates? Oh, man, where do I start? <laughs> I know, I've got a long list as well. I started typing a list. I was like, I said to my wife the other day, you got any pet hates, that like things that really bug you? And she's like, oh, my God, yeah. And she started rattling. I was like, hold on, hold on, hold on. I need to make some notes. <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's the usual, you know, other people are bastards and I hate them uh, stuff. Um like people who drive in the middle lane, people who eat with their mouth open, people selling stuff to me on my doorstep, religious people in shopping centers with PA systems spouting their religious bullshit, smokers. Um, the Venn diagram covers an awful lot of the population of the planet, unfortunately. Um, and I hate them all. And I tolerate some of them. I love driving in the middle lane, by the way. This is not a surprise to me, Joe. 
Like, <laughs> you, you, you occupy quite a large circle in my Venn diagram of people I don't like. So uh, this, the, the added little bit of you driving in the middle lane, not a surprise. I think you just said that you don't like me. I'm offended now. No, no, no. I said, I don't like everyone. I just like you, <laughs> dislike you slightly less. Oh, now I feel special. I guess thinking about it, hearing all your little pet hates, for the most part, I'm a pretty chill guy. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think a lot of those things that I always just go, ah, it's not a big deal. But the what I really, really don't like is like being ignored or being misunderstood or um, – like when you're interacting with somebody that you completely don't know whatsoever on the internet and you're never going to see them again and you don't, shouldn't care anything about them, but they just like think you're a bad person because you made a decision like that just drives me nuts. Um, but I don't know why things that like actually affect me, I don't care about. That's bizarre. Like actual <laughs> someone sat opposite you masticating like, um, 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 like <laughs> exactly that is not a problem but some rando dude that you moved his cheese like figuratively speaking and he doesn't like you that's more of a problem yeah i don't, maybe i'm just egotistical is the issue i have i have no idea i have no idea why i care more about that than like someone actually physically inconveniencing me in my space it's weird i've i've started to be a little more tolerant of those internet denizens and specifically the people who feel it necessary to tell me on Twitter that they've stopped using Ubuntu. I'm like, okay then. Like that's now my standard answer is okay then. Because how is this information useful to me? Like what am I going to, oh my God, oh, I'm really sorry. You've, oh, you stopped using Ubuntu. Oh my God, what am I going to do? Like, dude, I don't care. You could just as easily tell me you've switched from your Samsung uh, fridge to your Bosch fridge. I don't give a shit about that either. And I don't give a shit what lawnmower you use. Like, why would I care what operating system you use on your computer? Like, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm not, I'm not affected by it. So I find those people who protest at me and hate me online for some decision that was made for an intelligent reason with, you know, the mass market in mind adversely affected them or they don't like it fuck them basically all right well i managed to narrow it down to two <laughs> everyone who's breathing and everyone who's not breathing <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> no so um incorrect use of it apostrophe s <laughs> <laughs> eats shoots and leaves that's your bible isn't it yeah yeah i mean obviously all grammatical errors really pissed me off but that particular one of adding an apostrophe where it is not required and not <laughs> understanding that it apostrophe s means it is or it has and using that to mean it belongs to it that just really fucking triggers me i don't know why that one in particular but i just cannot stand it you really shouldn't have told us this this is your kryptonite now and we're going to use this all the time yeah i'm going to do it i'm going to find reasons to have other things possess things just so that I can <laughs> <laughs> just refer to everyone as it just so that I can do this. I realize I've made the same mistake and now you, you're both going to sit near me at some point and eat with your mouth open and, and yeah. that's going to annoy me. But and if I ever drive you, I'm going to just hog that middle lane. Hang on. If I'm in the car and we're in the middle lane, that's fine. It's every other fucker in the middle lane that's the problem. If you're driving in front of me in your car and I'm behind you, that's a problem. But if you're driving me and I'm in your car, fine, no problem. <laughs> see, I see. That's what the Germans would call a double morale, uh, double standard. Okay. What's your other one then? Uh, okay. It is when people refer to an Android device as an Android or my Android. Oh, God. <laughs> or people that still say droid. I don't know. I just, just my Android or like, oh, this is the best Android I've ever used. <laughs> like... No, it's like when my mother used to refer to a CD player as a CD. And it's like, no, a CD goes in the player. <laughs> you get annoyed by plug socket as well. Well, I don't know. That's, you know, that annoys me a bit. But, you know, it is a socket outlet technically. But, you know, at least you know what, what people mean by that. So how, how do you like your new droid, Joe? How do you like your new droid? 
<laughs> that doesn't trigger me as much. I don't mind because no one actually says that. But Android, I don't know, because an, an Android is a, a conceivable thing. It's a robot that is, you know, fairly human-like. And so people just have that idea that you can have an Android. But no, it's it's an Android device. It's an Android phone, an Android tablet. Wait, so you're telling me that the frustration comes with the confusion that you might own an automaton? <laughs> no, no. No, but that's, I'm just explaining why pro- probably people actually say that. I find a similar thing. I don't get anywhere near as angry, but I find a similar thing with um, inapt. Like, is it inapt? No, it's not in apt. Apt is a command. It's in the repository. Like, don't, don't ask me if it's in apt. It's not. It's like, oh, you'll find that in apt. No, I won't. No, I won't. <laughs> you know, that one annoys me a bit. But I sometimes say it to annoy people, to troll people, because I think that's cathartic. Sometimes you have to be the thing you hate. And sometimes I drive in the middle lane. And sometimes I eat with my mouth open because sometimes you just, to have to accept these things, and it, it, I, th- I find it it releases me a little bit. Okay, I have one more to drop that I'm sure everyone can agree with. Okay, press the red button. This one? No, the red one. This one? The one that says button on it. You mean this green one? No, the red one. The red one that says button, press that button. This one, the one on your finger, press that button. Is this people who can't follow instruction? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just most people because they're idiots. I think I'm inclined to agree with you. Uh, I find myself being almost unnecessarily specific in my instructions to other people, like like over-the-top specific. And that is my downfall because I'm super specific in my very first instruction. Like I was having a conversation with my wife and I was asking her, uh, where do I need to go to drop Sophie off? And she said, for some dance thing, she said, it's Woking. You need to go to Woking. I was like, yeah, I know that. I need to know exactly where I'm dropping her off. And she went, well, you go to Woking. I'm like, yeah, okay. Can we get past the fact that it's in Woking? Can we please get more specific about where I'm dropping off? Right, so you go down this road. As you come into Woking, no, no, no. I know how to get to Woking, right? (laughs) That's not the question I'm asking you. The question I'm asking you is, where do I drop her off specifically? Right, well, along this road, I was like, oh my God, just give me the fucking postcode. Like, I... I, I I was losing my shit. I really was. Because <laughs> I'm asking a very specific question and you're giving me like, well, in the universe, there's the Milky Way. And then inside, <laughs> I'm like, no. Nah! So, yeah, I totally get that. So here's a segment where I could probably spend half an hour arguing with myself because I do not know where I stand on it. Should humans spend billions on space exploration while so many people live in poverty. I'm so conflicted about this. I really think that we should go to the stars, but I also think that it's terrible that so many people in this world have very little and it does feel like a massive waste of money. But then we should go to the stars, but then we should look after them. So someone please make my mind up on this. Forget poverty. What about climate change? Yeah, true. We're all going to die. Hmm. I think you can reframe the question, which will make it more acceptable to your brain, Joe. Rather than say, should we spend billions on going to the stars? You should say, should we spend billions on science? Because that's really what this is. There's a load of scientific research that goes into this. There's a load of engineering that goes into this. There's a whole load of outcomes from the money that's spent on the space program. And I've seen figures which are of the order of the amount of money you put in, you get 10 times that back through the people who are paid to work on this stuff, the research, the things that you discover along the way, and new techniques in engineering, new manufacturing processes, things you learn along the way. It benefits us. Now, it doesn't benefit that guy who is on the poverty line directly. You could probably draw a very jagged line between you know, what you get from research that takes you into space, just like you could 
draw a jagged line from research that takes you to the Mariana Trench to that guy. It wouldn't be a direct line. You wouldn't be able to articulate to that person who's on the poverty line. Here is the th- the direct thing that you benefit from. It might be better sanitation, uh, better processes for preservation of food so their food doesn't go off as fast, so they don't have to worry about throwing food away and having to spend their very hard-earned money on more food because it's all rotten. Stuff like that, it's it's hard to quantify, but I totally think we should be spending the money on these things, yes. Yeah, they might be poor, but they've got Velcro shoes, so, you know. <laughs> I, I kind of, in thinking about this one, I feel like that exploration is is very romantic and it's something that might need to be done the way that we're kind of treating our current ecosystem. But I can't help but feel that as much as a space race would help general society, that so would a more applicable scientific race like an energy revolution or something else that we really, really need something a big some kind of big other enemy that we can face down that doesn't have to necessarily be going to space but something that as a human race that we can say this is incredibly important we need to get there well climate change is a perfect example of that if you could try and work out a way to generate lots of energy um you know through fusion or whatever it is that is not going to damage the environment and not going to contribute to climate change then maybe the knock-on effect of that would be, hey, we've got this cool new energy source that gives us a ton of energy and suddenly we can go to the nearest star or whatever. But how would we have known about the hole in the ozone layer over the Antarctic and the effect that chlorofluorocarbons had on the ozone layer if we didn't have satellites in space taking photos of it? Sure, and that that's true, but I think that just because we needed space exploration previously doesn't mean that maybe it isn't time to shift our focus and do some other important science thing. There can still be benefits. Like you look at things like um, Elon Musk's just launched like thousands or started launching thousands of satellites into space in order to provide internet access all over the world. If you think about, okay, there, are, I know there are going to be arguments that someone in poverty doesn't necessarily need internet access they need access to you know food and water and the basics but once you get over the basics of food and shelter education is a a massive driver that helps people lift themselves up and if they've got access to the internet there's a world of information out there that they can get access to and these are people who have no access to this kind of stuff in very rural, very remote areas of the world that are just not connected in the same way that Silicon Valley and Europe and Korea are, uh, are connected to the internet. And so there, there are benefits to putting this stuff in space. I'm not suggesting necessarily that traveling to the stars is is a super useful thing to do, but there are definitely benefits to mankind to putting that stuff up there. Well, it's like the Large Hadron Collider as well. That is seemingly just a waste of billions of dollars and tons of energy and everything. But ultimately, we might end up with a far greater understanding of the nature of reality as a result of that. And who knows what the benefits from that might be. If we don't do stuff for the sake of it, if we don't make explorations and do experiments just because we want to know what happens, then we'll never progress as a species. The other thing to look at is the proportions. It's not just the absolute value of how much we spend on putting stuff in space. There's also the proportion of how that compares to what we spend on other things. So, for example, in the UK, I think the last figure that I got was £371 million spent on space stuff in the UK. And obviously, we don't have as big a budget as other countries like the US, where it's like £20 billion or something. But the total health spend in England was 125 billion over the same period. So 371 million on space and in the same period 125 billion on health. And that's not including like loads of other things like that, that benefit normal people. That's just health spending in England alone. So you you can't just take the absolute value. You have to look at it in proportion with what you spend on other things as well. Yeah. Or you could just put that on a bus. <laughs> 